he was bisexual the babri is actually the name of the guy whom he was seeing we were trying to see hero out of babar mm. and uh, mm. trying to make him indian so indian to suddenly he is not But to quote dr ambedkar not in a very great way he said that history of india is all about struggle between the buddhism and the brahmanism the taj mahal what we see as a symbol of love was actually not a symbol of love but it was symbol it is a symbol of genocide british always claimed that we have civilized the, these barbarians or the asiatic people or the indians timurids so the moguls they gave us civilization so basically everything that is beautiful which has come to you today is by the grace of them but Uh, namaste and a very warm welcome to the Nationalist Madrasi. This is Intellectual Exchange with me, Sri Dharma Raghavan. In today's episode of the Intellectual Exchange, we have a very special guest, uh, Abbas Mahaldiar, author, columnist, is joined with us, and uh, he has recently written a book uh, based on Babar, uh, Babar, a chessboard king. So it's one of the best selling uh, in India right now. So congratulations, Abbas Ji, and thank you so thank much you. for appearing in our podcast. It's a pleasure to host you uh, all all the time. So. Why Babar, especially because uh, uh, there are many kings, um, right from uh, Delhi Sultanates to uh, till Aurangzeb, there are many kings. We often heard that Aurangzeb was so cruel, and uh, <laughs> he was uh, dim- uh, like shown in that way. But why Babar? Hmm. So first of all, a very warm namaste to all your viewers. It's certainly a pleasure to be on your show yet again. last time we were speaking something about ev ramaswami exactly. home people popularly like to call perrier rightfully not <laughs> uh, rightfully not so high he should be called so uh, yeah as far as the selection of the subject was concerned to me it was i won't say it was random but i would say that i had this freedom to choose whom i want to write upon because i am not obliged to certain academic uh, accreditation or i am not obliged to certain kind of a uh, professional aspect of historiography as many marxists want to point to as that if you deal with this this is what you can do history was always something or in fact it is something which has always given me a lot of joy i like to look into the past i want to collect the memories of the past and bring it forth in form of columns in form of articles and now the books why uh i was just thinking that i need to come up with some series of books on something and then as my memory goes back i was 4 year old when the incidents of uh, the babri demolition had happened it's in 1992 and i come from a town called hazari bag in jharkhand which is a small town and it's known for its uh, religious volatile nature mm-hmm. so religious volatile nature as in it means that each and every ram navmi we will have some kind of uh, confrontation some issues sometime right fill it up it, it was bound to happen once once it was always assumed that if it's a ram navmi something is going to go wrong so with that kind of uh, situations environment imagine that babri has been demolished and of course it has some absolutely it has to do with shri ram uh, it has a relation with shri ram because that's where our uh, temple uh, existed and it was demolished and a uh, structure was built upon it now it was the age i'm talking about 1992 when i'm 4 year old when we were not uh, the captives of the smartphones we were not the captives of the screens all around exactly. but we were the captives of even the news which you are bound to listen to because that's what you are going to see on the television because there's nothing as if whole family is watching a news so it's news if it's a 4 pm sunday movie that's what you are watching and is a narrative around the people what they are speaking that embeds in your mind uh, that carries forward so it's such a, it happens that if you're 4 or 5 years old 
and whatever is happening around you it always gets imprinted in your memory so i remember the discussions around babri because i told you that it was a really see very volatile environment and it had to do with the sri ram and hazari bagh ram nawmi is a big one like people today want uh, are looking to bring the sri hanuman dhwaj of big sizes and all but hazari bagh is known for big hanuman dhwaj so Uh, we would have competitions among the people that whose dhwaj is larger where it's going to be someone will have a 30 feet dhwaj someone will have 50 feet dhwaj large hanuman dhwaj etc and they would bring the procession out and when this procession would come it will pass through certain locality and something will happen so uh, with that given involvement babri happening and the narratives around it was always embedded that there was a thing called babri and as we knew it had something to do with babar so it came along with me as i grew it was always ingrained and because i do cherish a past of uh, i shouldn't say the word cherish but yeah past should always be cherished that's what i say irrespective of how it is so my past was uh, has been of being a marxist okay. and uh, being a marxist uh, i was somehow always uh, governed by an impression that uh, uh uh that the the mughals somehow were some great people uh, in fact they were the first bunch of people who tied india together which happened in the rule of uh, jalaluddin mohammad akbar whom we know as akbar so and my father being a historian also had given me a lot of anecdotes so these things were always back there in the mind but uh, it's it's so uh, that it happened that i got transformed and transformed in a way that i could realize that marxism is a sham and not only that i realized that marxism is a sham i also realized that you know there is something more in the indic past and the more and more i began to look into it of course it began by trying to understand what is hinduism what is uh, our dharma what is our past and when you start to begin to delve into religions culture etc you will delve into history and that's where it began and uh, somehow i could see that we had lot more greater kings from our side our side i am very serious about it when i to use the term our side because i am making distinction very clear mm-hmm. that these people were the foreigners okay. say the babar etc exactly, exactly. and our people as in one who were born in hindustan india bharat and they were actually the dharti putra but uh, but with the time uh, the narrative became popular especially on tv channels and suddenly everyone got into tv debates to talk about that whether mughals made india richer or not mm. so i'll come to that question <laughs> yeah so uh, but uh, so those debates were coming up and so uh, i was looking to research more into it and somehow the facts which were there and of course we'll detail it later uh, in the in course of the discussion but that was really a trigger point for me and i thought that i will just begin to do some powerpoint presentation give lectures here and there it began with that and then it was mohandas pai who said that you know when you have already done a fantastic job of compiling them as powerpoint presentations right why not a book then so it was important to come up with a book on whole of the empire empire and it was very important to start where it began so that's why it, it became pertinent to start the series with babar itself got it got it got it so as you mentioned uh, abbas ji uh, you all know that the british looted india but there is still a doubt and a question and a narrative i would say even uh, journalist or mainstream journalist uh, who are appearing in television or uh, the in the leading news channels today would openly come and say that the moguls made indian rich what is that kind of a narrative or uh, why are they saying like that so please explain us whether uh, first we'll discuss about this narrative and then we'll exactly go into this detail of whether the moguls made india rich or not yeah so uh, as i said that yes there was certainly a narrative which has been with us for long that india became one of the most powerful in the reign of the so called moguls in fact they were not moguls as well they never called them as moguls so they were actually called timurid gurkhania so these timurids made india richer they stitched india together as one state so uh, that is why whenever you will get into these kind of debates on social media said, uh, s- suddenly someone will bring a green map uh, in that rain and put in front of you that hey look at this this 
these these are the people who who binded india who created what you know as a unified nation or whatever right so before that we never had the sense of so uh, there had been few intellectuals who had this point of view that british were the people who gave this identity that india is a state and india is unified but uh, it was not uh, people were even more bizarre people even said that these were the moguls or the timurids rather who stitched the nation together there was a point of view that yes they made us richer they gave us architecture they gave us uh, 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 great food items they gave us all kind of art they gave us traditions they removed they brought a lot of reforms right so they basically made us civilized so you are always told that they a, a point of view that british always claimed that we have civilized the, these barbarians or the asiatic people or the indians but there were certain bunch of people who even saw it that this timurids so the moguls they gave us civilization they gave us culture tradition including architecture and we learned a lot from them had they not been in india perhaps we, we won't have known how to build perhaps we won't have known that what embroidery means perhaps we won't have known that how to chisel a sculpture and so on and on so basically everything that is beautiful which has come to you today is by the grace of them but again uh, i don't want to sound sound politically correct but again if the truth be told so if uh, uh, if a certain sect has got a hatred for almost all the art forms it's certainly the sect of the, the whom we know as the timurids or the moguls right so they have the hatred for music they have the hatred for sculpture they have hatred for anything which is beautiful and glorious okay. so that's the reason why you saw the what happened to the bamian mm-hmm. buddhas right uh, and we have enough of precedents so they hate everything which is which can speak of culture art okay. tradition okay. and it's so ironical that certain bunch of people mm. want to give all the medals to them mm. of the of being the people who give us what they actually didn't now whether they made us richer or not this is very uh, you know interesting point of view because yes i do understand that uh, so it was basically a, a a meme which was circulated by india today around four and a half years back or so and that meme was talking about the bash around the period of 1500 our gdp share was 25% okay so that's fine um, and they quoted a source called angus madison and so me being a person who who has always been very skeptical uh, skeptic about everything in fact i was a marxist too because i wanted to question even my tradition Uh, i went to that extent so i am the one who despite coming from a family which lived the tradition on their sleeves i went on to question the our, my own tradition so how will i not leave this people how will i leave this people so i went back i began to look at the source uh, that is angus madison angus madison is econo- economist who wrote a very interesting book called uh, world Eco- Con- uh, world economic contour or something like that from ad 1 to 2030 and uh, so it basically projects what will happen till 2030 and it also uh, uh, gives the data and statistics that what was happening in the past how the economy was right so i uh, uh, so uh, an economist may not agree to each and every assumption what angus madison has made and perhaps rightfully so it's certainly not a very right economic model perhaps we will never be able to calculate that what the gdp share was in that period but if you are going to quote this person to build a case that moguls or the timurids rather made us richer then i am going to quote him too mm-hmm. so then when i began to look at the data it was like in 1000 ad our gdp share was 32 uh, 28% in 1 ad it was 32% so in 1 ad it's 32% in 1000 ad it's 28% in 1500 it's 24.8% and the same source further tells you that our gdp share of the world went below china for the first time drastically in the period of jalaluddin mohammad akbar it went down for the first time but there was one thing that gdp share of india has always been shown almost constant it's 24 25 uh, it, it goes on and on till the, uh, the these people are ruling 
But another very interesting fact which came, uh, I, uh, which I came across was that GDP capita, GDP capita growth rate was negative from 1500 to 1820. So GDP per capita basically means that uh, while GDP per GDP share is GDP is the total wealth of the country and uh, what it has. Well, GDP per capita means that what what is the average that each and every person owns. So the growth rate was negative. Mm. And in fact, the Britishers whom we blame to have looted us the most. And of course, they looted and they did worst of the things. But by the statistics of same Angus medicine, it's from 1913 to uh, 1950 is when our GDP per capita growth went negative. Before that, it was from 1500 to 1820. So almost till the time when the rule of the stimulus coincides, right? People were becoming poorer. Okay. So if people are becoming poorer, GDP per capita growth is negative. That means your earning is reducing day by day. But if the GDP share of the country and country here means basically the Sultanate or the empire, mm -hmm. empire. So if it is all constant for them, it means that while the empire is becoming richer or it has been able to hold certain amount of money and if people's money is depleting, it means that people are facing the atrocity. There has been extortion. Those people are holding the money. So these two statistics give you that. So, uh, and this actually breaks the whole myth that the Mughals made us richer or something because and another angle which comes into play is whether um, it said that Babur came and he became one of us, right? And uh, he didn't take the loot back like how the British did. No one took the loot back, but that's really far from reality. Okay. Because Babur uh, did collect a lot of wealth. He gives a detail in Babur Nama and in absolute detail. In fact, I pointed that out sourcing from Babur Nama that how much money, how much gold and silver he has carried from Hindustan after the battle of Khanwa and after the, after defeating Lodi actually. So how much money he has carried, how much money he has sent to Uzbekistan, how much money he has sent to which bay, how much money he has sent to which Amir. So he has sent out money and resource. And in fact, he says that minimum one silver coin was given to each and every person in Kabul and all was taken from uh, India. India, India. So, uh, Babar himself is giving the whole account that how much wealth I have carried from this very richer land, which he calls India to be like, and he has carried it and he's taken. So, does it not seem like a loot even? Mm -hmm. the, uh, is it any different from what the Britishers were doing? It is exactly the same. He's doing the same thing. And in fact, in Babar Nama, he points out very clearly, he wants to come to Hindustan because uh, there's abundant gold, gold and silver. And at the same time, people are very docile. Mm. People are docile. So it, he means that he can actually engage people in a lot of work and they will not ask for anything in return. Got it. So he can get it done. So he was constantly, and there is even more uh, about, uh, if you want me to continue about Mughals, I can continue that. Definitely, definitely, definitely. So uh, like, uh, in fact, the loot continued and continued. Okay. It was a uh, trend to send a lot of money to Makkah. Okay. So it, in 1576 or uh, around that period when Akbar sent, uh, Akbar has, uh, has got the control in Surat mm. and through the ports of oh, the Surat, but, that's where he is sending mm, the mm, mm, ship to Mecca mm, mm. and around 6 lakh rupees are sent, 6 lakh rupees in that period, okay. right? So 6 lakh rupees have been sent to Mecca and uh, a lakh of rupees additionally has been sent for the Amirs mm. or the the sheriffs, sheriffs. Of, of the 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 treason because what Akbar is trying to do he's trying to become a Khalifa okay he's trying to become the ruler of the Islam mm. so that's what is intended so, so he, he, he he was knowing that uh, and doing that very in a yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. so uh, imagine that now you saw the GDP per capita mm. is declining and because the growth is negative so people are becoming poorer and this man in 1576 is sending six lakh rupees to Makkah and the primary sources tell us that so the Muslim world was so excited that the money is going to come from Hindustan so they all would come to Makkah in that period because they wanted whatever they can because this money were being sent a donation to give, be given to the people as a jakat or something so uh, people will come 
and uh, there was a period when the muslim world was not very rich mm. as mm. it's uh, you may see that today saudi arabia is very rich very wealthy the emirates are very rich but that was not the case back then mm. okay. so everyone will come flock around to just get a hold of money which is coming from hindustan so it it was a very much of a tradition this tradition was carried forward by other rulers as well jahangir did the same shah jahan did the same and shah jahan was really step ahead and story of taj itself is a big agony because when the taj was being commissioned i am using the word specifically commission because okay. because many people say that it was a, a tejo mahalya or okay. some people say that it was a palace of man singh so irrespective of whether a structure was refurbished or whatever but it was coming a project was commissioned mm. and that commission's cost was 4.18 rupees okay 4.18 crore rupees sorry okay, okay got it 4.18 crore rupees and mm. ru- rupee actually rupee meant the silver coin okay so almost 4.1 uh, 4.18 silver uh, coins were used to commission this project and when this when this has been commissioned for his wife who, who died in a very worst of circumstances and that's when a famine had hit surat deccan malwa okay these beds okay and that famine just to give the perspective to your audience that once we had faced a famine in 1943 mm. which was created by winston churchill okay right and in that famine we lost around 4 million people and the marxist held churchill responsible for it because churchill was enemy of the marxist mm, mm. right so they abused him till the date and a lot, lot of marx marxist literature would give the truth about it but coming back to here surat okay. 1630 31 when taj is commissioned and this famine is occurred what has happened that the governors of these regions mm. have revolted against shah jahan okay and they have joined hands with adil shahi okay Adil Shah is the enemies of Shah Jahan mm. in that period. So he has lost the control from these territories and that's when Shah Jahan decides to tease a lesson to these people. And all this region of Malwa and all are very fertile belt and they give him a lot of revenue. And it's like uh, it's like a thought in the mind of Shah Jahan as Lahori explains in the biography of Shah Jahan. Lahori is a co- court historian for this guy. and he's writing his biography and he explains that shah jahan then sends out his army to dist- and that army destroys the crops of the region the crops are trampled the idea was that if these this cannot belong to us because that crops gives you the maximum revenue it's not it doesn't so it will not even give you revenue to them so destroy the crops and once the horses pass over the fertile land the land is not fertile enough because it taps on the horses so the land became a bit unfertile for a time being then the rain um, um the rain didn't happen the crops were destroyed and exactly what churchill had done in 1943 with a different model the same thing was done around say um, 300 years back 3 310 uh, years back by a guy named shah jahan and while and while the people were dying in this famine around 7.4 million people died in this famine okay. when the population was much more lesser okay here in calcutta in 1943 when the famine created by churchill around 4 million people died population is way larger than 1633 and 10 years back and this right and the uh, the eyewitness account of that famine is so ugly that peter mundi uh, the one of the traveler who is a eye, who gives eyewitness record he says that famine is so bad that people are eating from the excreta of the dead people are trying to trade the the the, the goat meat for the dog meat Mm, mm, mm. the people are selling up the children as a slave so that at least they can live they slave is being a slave is fine but at least they will be living and the ugly records are even even given by lahori his biographer so uh, collectively you get to know that the taj mahal what we see as a symbol of love was actually not a symbol of love but it was symbol it is a symbol of genocide I as an architect will never challenge its aesthetics and I always felt that it is a amazing example of aesthetics it's beautiful it's gorgeous as a structure but I cannot underpin the fact that or I cannot deny the fact that it was built when a lot of people were uh, were killed because of the construction was so it was built at the blood of the genocide of so many 7.4 million Indians money which was used was again extorted by these people 4.18 crore silver coins 
when 7.4 million people are dying out of famine this is what this guy is doing and that that money is also extorted from the same, same people and it is built by indian artisans so at times the guys like uh, many politicians would make a claim hum taj bhi le jayenge to what will you do what will you do if we take the taj what will you be left with mm -hmm. but boss the taj was built by the uh, the blood of us mm -hmm. the, uh, our ancestors blood the taj was built by our artisans the taj was built by our money okay. then who are you to even claim it exactly there, there's no point so uh, it's just a very brief uh, premise of what was happening to our economy and there's lot to tell on it but for for the interest of time i will hold sure. over here but sure. it can certainly tell people it can give a hint that what was happening in that era okay okay got it sir so just uh, going a little back we often we heard that uh, mohammed ghazni took uh, 17 times on india and then at the last time he won some stories like that but often we also heard that uh, 17 times he came to loot india and then i'm just going a little back and out of the story so is that true like uh, so for the 17 times or this 18 times so he was coming and looting the india then he captured india so what was that story actually so uh, gazi's intent was not to loot okay so uh, um, of course loot is something which always comes as a given mm. thing mm. like how that's it in fact even when you look at the uh, any battles of the islamic reign where is battle of badr mm. battle of badr was fought in the period of prophet muhammad and it's a battle against the makkans and uh, and the, when the war is raised so uh, these people take the spoils of the war mm. the women are taken as a captive so the sex slaves and so on non so the spoils naturally come into it purpose is something else purpose is to uh, really spread islam destroy the kafirs uh, and that's the reason why in fact ghazni had also taken the expedition and in fact there accounts which also tell you that when the the peer the, the the brahmins offered the idols to uh, offered money to ghazni that um, you know you take this money and uh, just leave the idol don't destroy it then ghazni boastfully said that i will like to be known as a idol breaker rather than be called a person who traded the idol or idol seller so in fact what it tells you that he would have got a abundant money but the money can follow the wealth can i can take it later i will any way take it if i have destroyed you god. but i'm not going to let your uh, the, the god live because that's god to us that vigraha we do the pran pratishtha exactly means a lot to us and it also tells you a lot of stories because the structures what the people destroyed they humiliated it they will mutilate mm -hmm. it in a way okay. that it always is in in front of your eye it is always scarred that mm. you know our gods were humiliated there are the tales i have spoken about a tribe called junbil tribe here mm, okay in the book so junbil tribe are the tribe which was founded by a person named rutbil rutbil was uh, um, uh, the cousin of the person who founded a turk shahi Okay. So these were the Hindu tribes of uh, in and around Afghanistan and the Central Asian region. So and they were very much Hindu till very recent times. Say that um, in fact, till uh, Ghazni came in, uh, they were very much Hindu, and they fought brick and bat. So there's a story that the, these people Jumbils used to worship a god called Zun God. So Zun God was the sun god or the Aditya god, Aditya, which we call for the sun. So there was a Uh, a, a, a ruby uh, gems which i put in the eye so th this will glow and so when one of the invaders had come so what he had done he had plucked the eyes out and he made a statement that look what i have done to your god he can't even see now at what i'm going to do to you okay so and again these are the folklores of afghanistan mm. it's coming not from say that mm. someone would say try to dismiss it out as this is a narrative hindutva narrative which comes from the cow belt of up north and mm. something mm. right that uh, you always want to have the enmity against uh, the muslims and so on and on but this is coming from the cow belt of afghanistan for heaven's sake okay and so they are telling you this tale about the jun god and of course the ghazni wanted to come in here uh, more and more time and uh, they, there is a thing that he wanted to wage jihad each and every year he wanted to plunder it the, he wanted to in uh, every circle and the intent was to destroy the idols to destroy the hindus and hindus were shattered 
this is what uh, the, the uh, I forgot the name of that philosopher mathematician uh, who Al Biruni who talks about it okay. Okay. Uh, that uh, the Hindus are scattered okay. like atoms and so on. Not. So uh, of course uh, his intentions were very clear. There was no int. Of course. Uh, loot came as a added thing it will automatically happen mm -hmm. let's say that i have destroyed everything in a house household and nobody else, else is gonna stop me and of course i will take away everything uh, if you look from that criminal perspective so these criminals or the terrorists or whatever uh, they may see uh, one may like to see them as given the current context so they always came here to destroy the hindus to wage a war against uh, the 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 kafirs and Take all the properties. Got it, got it, got it. Sir, uh, as you uh, earlier mentioned about that, uh, uh, it was on the Hindu side. So, but even still, I mean, not it was on the Indian side actually. But even still, some people claim that Babar is from India, and uh, like uh, when when the Ram and the debate was gone, like uh, uh, one side was asking like, who is Baba? Why are you uh, uh, asking, or why are you standing for him? Okay, but even still, people from India stand for Babar, who is an outsider. Where did that uh, thought actually came from there? So, you know, Dharmaji, this is very ironical. Mm. I'll tell you why. Mm. And, and this question came to my mind when I was just researching on the life of Babar. Mm. So, this question hit me that because, of course, today it's seen on the debate that people are trying to defend Babar, trying to make him more Indian than even the Prime Minister and so on and on. Uh, people have gone on to that extent to say about him that uh, so much praise to Babar. But even back then, Babar was back then as in before these debates came to the TV channels, etc. Um, Babar was suddenly humanized to a very normal extent. And he was not humanized in a way that how exactly he was. He was made more like a very alien to the nature than he was. So, uh, uh, my attempt also in the book is to humanize him, not to make a superhuman out of him. Superhuman is a trait that say you are somebody and someone will just make something out of you which you are not. Yeah. So, I'm trying to bring him back to the level what this guy was. Now, Babar was certainly, uh, Babar came to uh, India for a clear purpose. That purpose was to fulfill the dream of Taimur. And Taimur's dream was to establish a, a Islamic state throughout the world because Yazdi, the biographer of Taimur, said that says that uh, with the biggest motive of uh, Taimur is to Islamize whole of the world because Prophet mm -hmm. Muhammad instructed it. Got it, got it, got it. And he wanted to do it. Now, Babar goes on to compare himself with Ghazni and Gori. Mm -hmm. He says that after Prophet Muhammad, two people came from Tramontana who came and ruled here. And they are Ghazni and Gori, and I'm the third one. So he's comparing himself with the idol breakers. Two of them. He is not got comparing it, himself it. with. Got it. Got it. Now, Babar has got three, four important traits. Hmm. So because you're talking about the people trying to see hero out of Babar hmm. and uh, hmm. trying hmm. to make him Indian. So Indian, though certainly he is not. But even if people want to idolize him, want to look him as a hero. So the first point which comes is, yes, he was a great poet. I will not deny it. Okay. But for poetry, you're not gonna, you know, idolize him because he was not even as great as Mirza Ghalif. Okay. Right. So he was not even that great of a poet that you will idolize him for his poetry. Second trait, what he had that he was, of course, um, he cared a lot for his family. He had a lot of emotions attached because he lost his father at the age of 11. So the circumstances eventually made him quite an emotional man too, for his family at least. I'm sure that these are the things which is not inspiring the people who get inspired from Babar. The third trait of him was that he was bisexual. Okay. So, uh, because, and Babri is actually the name of the guy whom he was seeing. Mm. And this is happening during his mm. first marriage. Okay. So, when the first marriage happens with Aisha Begum uh, Sultan and who is the uh, daughter of his own uncle. Uh, it's around 15 and one of uh, something around that period. Mm -mm -mm. And Babar is 16, 17 year old. And he says in Babar Nama that I am very much um, not attracted towards my wife. I don't want to go and okay. live with her. Mm -mm. I visit twice a month or something because I'm very dispassionate to be even with mm -mm. her. I'm very 
disattracted. I'm not attracted. I think him. many of the Delhi Sultanates or the Mughal rulers have been accused with this uh, yeah. point of being a bisexual yeah. or uh, uh, gay or something. So yeah. uh, from where did it actually get? Uh, they had to be like this actually because I see many of uh, uh, according to their religion it is not. But where did this culture came to their front actually? So uh, you know one thing which me and Kushal had observed that it was a very you know elite mm. syndrome that okay. if I'm elite and uh, I can do just anything, whatever okay. we wish to do. Mm, mm, mm. It was more of a entitlement, entitlement which came within them, and they felt to do anything. So Bauer was bisexual, and this uh, because he is writing poetry for Babri, and during the first marriage, he's mentioning that while I am not looking to go with my wife, I found a guy called Babri in the camp bazaar, okay. and I'm maddened in his love. Mm -mm. I'm attracted to this lad. Mm -mm -mm. So Babar is talking in the context of his. So you and you, when you read those chapters in Babar now, which uh, I have uh, from sourcing from there, I have detailed this out. I have sourced the uh, poems from Babar Nama and mentioned the poems which he has written for Babri, right? So you can make it out that suddenly Babar had attraction towards Babri more than his wife, okay. and intimately. It was suddenly an intimate way at which he was looking at Babri, right? Okay. So now the third trait is him being bisexual or gay. First was being a poet. Second was uh, being a family connected man. Third is his bisexual. Fourth is was he was very alcoholic. Okay. Okay. So he drank like anything once upon a time. Though he regretted as well, but he drank. Mm. Now fifth trait what he had was hatred for the kafirs, mm. killing the Hindus. Okay. Killing the kafirs. Mm. Destroying the idols, comparing himself with Bushikan. He wanted to be a Bushikan or the idol breaker. Mm -mm. So out of these five threads, certainly Islam is not going to approve of uh, one being a gay or bisexual. Exactly. exactly. We are going to throw the person from the terrace. Exactly. This is what Taliban or the ISIS does. Exactly. Right. Alcohol, you had, they will like, alcohol is absolute no. Exactly. You know, you can't be inspired from Babar that because he wrote a couple of, uh, so yeah. few couplets in the poems, etc. The five traits of Babar. The first one is of course about him being poet, the second is about he connected to his family, mm. third is you know where he is alcoholic and fourth is by being bisexual, right? And fifth is jihad okay. or the attack against the kafirs uh -huh. or, or what he wanted to be just another idol breaker. Mm. So what exactly is something which can make people to idolize him? Certainly not being the poet because he's no Mirza Ghali or something. Right. Mm, mm, mm. Certainly not because he is so connected with his father because that cannot be something that he I want to be. So that way there would have been many such characters. Mm. So and then he has done something which is kufr in Islam, which is say being alcoholic, being bisexual. Right. So I'm, and I'm sure that the people who want to idolize Babar are not going to like the gays for sure. I'm uh -huh. not going to like the people who are alcoholic. Right. Exactly, exactly. So is it really the hatred? For the kafirs, which mm -hmm. again binds them with the no this notion to see Babar as an idle person. So this question goes back to them. But why exactly are you doing this? So I can't see anything of Babar because he was not even a great conqueror for that matter. Exactly. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, that's why I have called him a chessboard king exactly. because he was like a king who could not even make his place firm in his own territory because he would go from one territory to, to here, he'll lose the other one. He'll go there and he'll lose the other one. And so, and there's an arch enemy of him, Shaibani Khan, who keeps on following him. And he keeps on following and that's where he has made his life more like a chessboard king. Got it, got it, got it, yeah. got it. I just want to have some questions before we end this conversation. Yeah. Actually, we are running out of time. Uh, but two things. One is like, uh, where did the mindset of destroying the temples came from? Right from Babar to, or from the earlier rulers also, to Aurangzeb. Yeah. We have the record of they, I mean, Mughals destroying the temples actually. Where did the idea of uh, destroying the temples came from? Or uh, uh, as earlier you mentioned about the jihadist mindset as well. So it was in, in the origin or it was suddenly uh, rise to something. What, where did the idea come from? So this idea is, so I always say that, uh, like, again, to quote Dr. Ambedkar, not in a very great way right now. So he often said, he said that uh, history of India is all about the struggle between the Buddhism and the Brahminism. Mm. He, at some point of time, he talked about it. But again, um, 
like he was a mixed bag and he had different kind of opinions about different people but let's not take him so seriously for history but i do see uh, the indian history at least as a struggle between the idol makers and the idol breakers it is all about certain people who wanted to make the idol worship it and there were certain people who wanted to destroy it and actually this not only can be applied on in india but can be applied all over the globe if you read the book of catherine nixon about uh, uh, the darkening which is called darkening age like how christian world wiped out the pagans right how the idols were broken how the culture were destroyed so and there also the battle was between certain people who worship the idols mm. who worship the murtis or vigra or some sense and uh, uh, pe- the people who don't ha- like the idols or who don't want to s- uh, who hate the idol worshiping who wants to break the idol in fact in goa inquisition people talk about the islamic iconoclasm but they don't talk about what the christians also did like exactly. xavier was a uh, xavier led to a lot of iconoclasm in the goa inquisition mm. a lot of temples were destroyed Definitely. sculptures were destroyed exactly so uh, you know this has always been there it comes from the fundamentals and at times we often talk about the fundamentalist but we don't talk about the fundamentals so if you don't talk about the fundamentals fundamentalists will keep on popping up it's it's just like a pattern like you had ghazni you had gori you had khilji and so on and on so coming till aurangzeb and even in the recent times right so it's not gonna be, it's not something which just drop down just as an idea which came only to the stimulated rulers but it was always in green because that's the fundamental you okay. have to do it this okay. is your religious duty okay got it got it so the uh, one last question i would uh, uh, like to ask all of these uh, either it is akbar or the jahangir uh, we used to learn that uh, whether the history uh, uh, what we have learned is wrong or not please correct us uh, jahangir uh, himself was a painter he loved art as you mentioned like they uh, didn't love art or they destroyed the culture but we learned what we learned is like jahangir himself is a painter jahangir uh, loved the art and akbar was so secular and akbar had a very good relationship with the indian kings and so and so there if we talk about the mughal dynasty it, it won't be Uh, yeah, a day won't be enough for a podcast or a day won't be enough to talk about the Mughals or something so but what is your take on all these kings there? because like uh, what we have been taught in schools that's what has been replicated and till now the UPSC syllabus is having the medieval history is filled up with uh, uh, Mughals and the other things I, I don't know whether we read about the other kings or the Vijayanagar empire or not but uh, in the Mughal history uh, we read about this thing only so what is your take on that so you know even the ancestor of these mughals rather than timurids knew that who vijayanagar was mm-hmm. uh, what the vijayanagar was um sharuk uh, ancestor of babur who happens to be uh, who comes from the lineage of timur is his son and uh, he is the ruler in that period of the timurid empire and he just has heard up somewhere that there is an empire vijayanagar which is richer than his empire and so he sends his uh, ambassador abdul rajak and when abdul rajak comes and sees vijayanagar he is astonished he says that the size of the king's palace is larger than our biggest of the bazaar the gems and the precious stones are sold on the, the street like they if they are selling cereals the gold is just flowing so he was just taken aback uh, by uh, by this thing as far as the architecture is concerned in fact the largest structure in samarkand is smaller than taj mahal and that structure i'm just giving a perspective so that people can take a skill uh that structure is the mausoleum of timur and to build that structure also artisans from india were brought in mm. timur's mausoleum and this is what babur records in babur nama that timur's mausoleum was also built by the indian artisans and then these people tell you that they gave us architecture was their architect the largest architecture was is not even to the size of taj mahal and we have many structure bigger than taj mahal with more intricate details we have the ajantas we have the eloras and so on and on like if one goes there and because architecture is not just about carving i understand it carving is a very different art together it's more about the sculpturing and next thing but in terms of architecture in terms of the planning sense 
uh, when you look at the Vijayanagar, Vijayanagar is such a city which can become a case study for any modern urban planners and urban designers. Not. And in fact, the architects too. So, and Jahangir certainly was uh, Jahangir or Shah Jahan. I told you already about Shah Jahan that what he did, he created the great feminine and so on and on. And Akbar was no greater either. And uh, so we eventually never built any that great structures as we used to build in the past. Whatever the structures they built, this was more for their own uh, pleasure. It was more for their recreation. Mm. And that's why you see, saw the gardens coming up, etc. But they certainly didn't give us what they have been often told to be the person to have given us. Got it, got it, got it. Uh, on this note, uh, due to time constraint, we end this podcast. Sir, thank you so much for joining with us. Uh, I hope uh, you should regularly give us some insights about uh, all the Mughal uh, history and which has been um, like what is uh, what we can say as demystified and the wrong history uh, we learned for all these days. Thank you so much, Abbas Ji, for joining with My us. Pleasure. It's a pleasure always talking to you. Thank you.